This is a snapper skull. And here's how you can make one of these little puzzles for yourself at home. Coming up, I've also got a bonus recipe for you. Towards the end of last year, I was lucky enough to land this beautiful Sydney snapper. Now, if you're a line fisherman, this might not seem too exciting, but as a Spiro, snapper are one of those fish that seem to elude you at every turn, especially in Sydney. Refining your diving skills and hunting techniques can take years for some people to land a nice snapper. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I am definitely not there. A combination of less than ideal visibility, some nice late afternoon sun, and my mate throwing his throw flasher around in the distance helped to bring this fish in and land me a beautiful 50 odd centimeter Sydney snapper. It's definitely no giant, but for me, it was pure froth. <laughs> These fish are stunning to look at. You've got pearlescent scales running the length of the body, running from pink to spritzing quarter blue shimmering in the light. Above the eye, you've got this deep blue, almost purple spot surrounded by iridescent scales blending from gold to copper to blue. Down the back, they even have these luminescent spots and if you get them in the dark, they will actually glow. They've also got some gnarly looking teeth in there. And sometimes, especially on the older males, you'll get this giant bump on their head. Previously, I've made up some jaws out of Bonito, which have some sick looking teeth and some other species like brim, but I've never made a full skull and I've always had a few little dramas in the preservation. And we're gonna deal with that a little bit later on. At the end, we're gonna run you through some tips and tricks of what I might do differently as well to what I did this time, just to make it even more premium. It was about a week out from Christmas when I landed this beautiful snapper and I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to prepare. I think I get a bit paralyzed trying to come up with a recipe or an idea that I feel can really capture the moment. I understand for some people this might just be another fish, but for me it was a rare and special moment to be savoured. So without much of an idea of what I was going to do, I decided to just sukibiki the fish, which is a process of using a nice sharp knife to cut the scales off rather than scraping them. This removes the scale pocket, membrane, whatever you want to call it, and the scale itself, leaving just the skin behind. Nice. I also cut the peck fins off and then hung the fish in the fridge so I could figure out what I wanted to do with it. If you're interested in this whole process that I've just outlined, you can check out my series, How to Dry Age Fish at Home. Seven days later, Christmas came around and I figured cooking this fish for my family would be a perfect way to savor the moment. A great way to share a fish amongst a group of people is to cook it whole. There's plenty of bones to navigate, but it makes for beautiful presentation and it maximizes the usable meat as well. I decided to stuff the belly with a mix of fennel, parsley, tarragon, and garlic. No lemon here. I want to really maximize the flavor of the fish and I don't want to overpower it in any way. From there, I brush the skin down with olive oil and then sprinkle on some chunky sea salt. Put it in the barbecue at 180 degrees and cook it until we've got an internal temperature of just below 60 degrees Celsius. For cooked fish, we want a temperature just over 60, but you've got to remember this fish is going to keep cooking from residual heat even once we take it out. And then to finish it off, I poured a beautiful fresh salsa verde that I made all over the top of the fish. Beautiful recipe with fresh herby flavors and nothing overpowering the fish itself. It also pays to mention that if you are gonna grill a whole fish like this, make sure you cut the peck fins off. They're gonna burn, they're gonna crisp up, they're not gonna be particularly presentable or nice to have on the fish. In the interest of not wasting any of the meat on this fish, I did eat a lot of the head meat and even the eyeballs themselves. Eyes might not be your cup of tea, but there's plenty of people around the world who do love fish eyeballs. Mm. It's delicious. And there's even chefs now coming up with clever ways to make use of the eyes. Chefs like Josh Nyland developing eyeball chips, something resembling a prawn cracker. The eyes are fatty, gelatinous, and full of rich umami flavors. Exploding in your mouth, absolutely delicious. Something I never let go to waste on a fish. In eating all of this head meat, I did unfortunately lose some of the gill plates and even some of the delicate bones in the eye itself. Despite that, we're still gonna crack on and see what we can come up with. First up, we want to remove any remaining skin or meat from the bones. We want to get them all separated and as neatened up as possible before we move on to the next steps. I place mine here into some boiling water straight out of the kettle. And that's plenty enough to soften up any remaining meat on these cooked bones. In the past, I've even done this on the stovetop, 
steeping the head in a pot of boiling water. In future though, I'm probably gonna do this slightly differently. And at the end of the video, I'll explain to you why and how I'm gonna do this. Some people like to leave some of this cartilage on these bones to hold them together. It just makes assembly a little easier later on. I feel it's best to remove as much of these soft tissues as possible though for long-term preservation, even though it might make the reassembly of the skull itself a little fiddlier. Once all that meat's softened up, let's begin cleaning the bones. If you've ever pulled something apart, you'll know taking photos throughout the process is super helpful when assembling later on. As you pull bones out, try and remember how they sat and how they interacted with each other. Often the fatty gelatinous skin can be stuck to the bones and I've found an old toothbrush is the perfect tool for giving them a good scrub. Work the bristles into any little nooks and crannies. Take care especially inside the skull where any pockets of meat or brain tissue might be hiding. During this process, you may find some bones that seemed whole will come apart. Don't worry too much, we'll put them back together later, but just try and take note of how they fit together. Take photos if you need. Don't worry about getting these bones spotless the first time. We're gonna go back and do it again. Continue breaking this skull down, cleaning off as much of the meat as you can. As we go, I like to stack each of the bones in pairs just to make sure that everything is accounted for. Aside from the actual skull itself, which I guess would be the cranium, there should be pairs of everything. With all of that broken down and most of that meat off, I'm gonna repeat this process, soaking the bones in near boiling water again. This time though, I'm gonna recruit the help of a skewer just to help get into any of those little tight nooks and crannies. I'm also gonna make sure I work the toothbrush into any of those little grooves and cracks to get any of that meat out. This feels especially fitting when you go to the teeth and you start brushing all that meat out from in between. Clean. Number one recommended by dental professionals. Again, I'm stacking all the bones in pairs just to make sure I have everything accounted for. Back in for another soak now and you can see just how much clearer this water is this time. The more work we put in now, the easier our job is gonna be later on and the better result we're gonna have long term. Once everything's scrubbed up, I'm gonna throw it all into a sieve and give it a quick rinse under the tap. Now this step might not be entirely necessary, but I did give my bones a quick soak in hydrogen peroxide. And the thinking here was to kill anything that might still be living on it, but I don't think it's particularly necessary for this overall process. So if you didn't wanna buy extra hydrogen peroxide, I probably wouldn't worry about it too much. After soaking for around 24 hours, I took the bones out of that hydrogen peroxide. Now leaving them in for more than 24 hours, they might start becoming a little brittle. Let's first get rid of any of that extra liquid and then we'll put our bones into the dehydrator and set it aside. The dehydrator is a fantastic tool to have in the kitchen. It's got so many uses and it's perfect for us in this bone cleaning process. Without it, you're gonna be waiting days between steps for your bones to air dry. Now there's a fairly significant range in price for dehydrators, but my rule of thumb is always to try and hit that middle of the pack. They're a fairly simple machine though, so even a cheap one might get the job done. In the description below, I'm gonna leave a few links for a range of dehydrators, and I haven't used any of these specifically, but it will give you an idea of what's out there. If you do decide to buy anything through these links, it doesn't cost you any extra money, but it does help me just a little bit to keep making videos just like this for this channel. If you really want, you can use an oven for this process as well, but you've got to leave it at about 40 to 60 degrees Celsius if your oven can go that low, and it may be running all day. Usually I'm running my dehydrator for 24 to 36 hours. 24 to 36 hours later, our bones are nice and dry, but we've got these big, greasy, oily marks all over them. And it's especially prominent here on this big bump on the top of the skull. If we don't treat this now, down the road, it's gonna end up a lot like this bonito jar I made up a little while ago. The peroxide bleaches the bones and at first they look beautiful, nice and white, but over time, those oils and the fat and the grease starts to leach out of the bone and forms this browny, orange, greasy mess. The snapper skull's a bit over a month old now and it's still a beautiful white. Maybe a bit of an off-white, but I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail at the end of the video about why I think that might be and what I'm gonna do differently next time. So how do we stop this greasy mess? Well, let me set your expectations. This is not a quick process. You could end up waiting a few weeks at this point. There's a few options here and they vary in price point and effectiveness, I would say. Your first option is dish soap. And I don't have any specific ratios here, but you just wanna load it up and mix it with some hot water. The only thing here is you wanna be keeping this at quite a hot temperature. Between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius is probably gonna be good. And it's gonna help draw out all of that grease and oil from the bones. Now, as this process could be weeks long, I don't think anyone's gonna be happy with you leaving this on the stove top. Some people recommend using a water heater with a thermostat. I've never used this method, so I don't actually know what to suggest for you here. It's probably not the option I would choose if I'm honest. It appears cheap, but 
and it's got some fiddly little parts to it. You basically just want to leave that until the water turns brown and a little scummy. There's no real specific time for that, but the longer, the better. Another option is to use ammonia, and apparently, much like the dish soap method, you want to keep that warm as well. Again, I haven't tried this method, and it's probably not the one I would pick. What I did use is acetone, and it was super simple. It is a little bit more expensive, but I would say for the ease of use, it's probably the best option. I only used to soak my bones in hydrogen peroxide, but I'd always end up with a greasy, brown, and oily mess at the end of it. Now though, after talking to Josh, I started soaking my bones in acetone, and they always ended up beautiful, white, and pristine. Acetone may cause mild to moderate irritation to the eyes, nose, and throat. Some individuals may experience headaches, dizziness, and nausea. In higher concentrations, acetone exposure might lead to confusion, increased pulse rate, and in severe cases, unconsciousness. Long-term exposure to high levels of acetone can cause liver and kidney damage. Always handle acetone with care, always use it in well-ventilated areas, and always store it safely out of reach of children. Consult with a professional today to see if acetone is right for you. This stuff has some crazy fumes and you definitely don't want to be breathing it in. So make sure you're using it outside and if it tickles your fancy, even using a respirator. Acetone will also melt plastic, if that gives you an idea of how potent this stuff can be. It doesn't melt all plastics though, so here's a list of the plastics that are safe to use with acetone. Make sure you check your buckets, they should have a little label on them describing what kind of plastic they are. And you can see the little PP <laughs> at the bottom of my bucket here, indicating that it is polypropylene, so we are in the clear. All of those warnings and cautions aside, it's way easier to use. You just put your bones in, cover them in acetone, put the lid on, and then you wait. To give you an idea, I waited about three to four weeks before I moved on with the process. After a few weeks of soaking the acetone, you can see it started to turn a yellowish color and it's doing its job. It's pulling all those grease and oils out of the bones and to the surface. They're a little bit brown at the moment, but we'll sort that out soon with some hydrogen peroxide. Between cycles of degreasing and bleaching, we wanna make sure our bones are 100% dry. Hydrogen peroxide and acetone can have quite a bad chemical reaction. So I always make sure I leave my bones in for at least 24 to 36 hours until there's no moisture left. With our bones nice and dry after the degreasing, we're gonna put them into some hydrogen peroxide. And here I've got 6%. You can find stronger stuff as well if you like, but the main thing is to be using this solution, not the paste that you would use in your hair. You also don't wanna be using bleach or anything similar to that. These harsher chemicals are actually gonna start breaking down the bones and over time they will just fall apart. Put the bones in the dish and then cover them in the hydrogen peroxide. And if you need a little bit of water just to top it up, go for it. After that 24 hours is up, let's chuck our bones into the dehydrator and dry them once again. And with these bones dried for the final time, degreased and bleached, you can still see there's a little bit of discoloration. And again, at the end, I'm gonna go over why I think that might be and what I'm gonna do differently next time. I think this is the best we're gonna get these bones though, so let's go ahead and start rebuilding this skull. It's super useful to have some reference photos of complete skulls as well as your own photos and videos you took earlier. This is just gonna help you figure out exactly how everything fits together. Hunting around online is likely you'll find some relevant images from scientific papers or sites. If you can't find your exact species of fish, don't stress too much. A lot of species have similar skeletal structures and I've found for the most part, while some bones may look slightly different, many of them fit together still in similar ways. I bought two different glues to try for this and first hit the Gorilla Glue Super Gel stuff here. 10 seconds they reckon to go off, no run and all the rest. Don't always believe it folks, this stuff was no good for it. You want glue that goes off pretty quick. Some of these pieces, you gotta awkwardly hold them together while you try and get two tiny bits of surface area to bond. This stuff though, the Loctite, the Control Squeeze Super Gel Jobby here, was far easier to get out and it went off real quick. Now this is a fiddly and time consuming process to get a good result. If you've ever made models, it's actually quite similar. We're just using bone here instead of plastic. I like to get all the pieces laid out pretty much as they're going to go together. I find it easiest to start with the jaw. It's a great part to start on because if you're finding this all too difficult as well, the jaw alone can make quite a cool piece to mount. There's a few different parts here and plenty of waiting in between stages for pieces to dry before moving on. On the back edge of the lower jaw, we have these little pieces that fit into the pocket just here. Let's glue them in and let them dry.
While those are drying, I'm going to get a few more pieces laid out. Again, I'm putting them down roughly in the pattern they're going to fit together. Working on the top drawer now, I'm gluing the two halves together along that long edge there. Once the glue is somewhat dry, you can add a little extra in there as well to try and reinforce that join. Again, let's set this down and leave it to dry. While I wait, I'm starting to look at other pieces and think about how they're going to be fitting together. Once I'm happy with how they're looking, I'm going to start gluing in these front nose pieces, I'll call them. It's cool to see the skull beginning to take shape after all this work that we've put into it. Utilize materials all around you to help make this job easier. Using some packaging from that no good super glue, I can make up a little cradle to hold that skull while the glue on those new pieces goes off. While we wait for some of that glue to go off, let's get back to the jaw. I'm just going to add some extra glue to the back again to try and reinforce it. The top jaw has these bones that sit on top on either side. When you find the right orientation, they will make sense, slipping nicely into the little grooves towards the center. Glue both of these on and again, allow it to dry. With those on, you can start to see it all taking shape and it's good here to play around and start visualizing how it's all going to fit together. Let's get the bottom jaw all sorted now, gluing that short edge in the middle. I find it easiest to balance them like this, teeth down and leaning into each other. Just do it on a solid surface and don't knock it over. Again, waiting for those pieces to dry, I started to play around with some of the bones that make up the gill structure. Unfortunately, there weren't many of these left, but I wanted to see what I could use to at least make something resembling a complete skull. Figuring out how some of these bones fit together can take a lot of patience. It took a lot of trialing, angles and different positions, referencing images and visualizing how these structures might work to get these bones to fit together again. Not all these bones will make it easy for you sitting in a joint, which you can use to piece together like it's a jigsaw. Others like this bone that forms the edge of the gill plate simply sit in a little groove and they're normally held in by soft tissue. After playing around with that for a while, I had a good idea of how these were going to fit together. And our bottom jaw is nice and dry. So it's time to start assembling our complete jaws. Getting these positioned, angled and set out properly can be a fiddly process. Utilize whatever you can to hold them and angle them exactly how you want. Once you're happy, leave it and just be patient. You don't want to disturb these pieces after all that work just to get them in the right position. After a little while, they should be nice and dry and you should have something that looks like this. Next up, I want to get these gill plates that we played around with earlier all sorted. You can see just how well that first bone connects to the skull. But this other piece just kind of floats outside of that. It's a fiddly one, but let's have a crack and get it stuck on there. When I'm holding it up to the jaw there, you can see just how it all fits in. We don't have far to go now. Now, as I had to put a lot of these nose bones back in myself, some things weren't quite lining up. And as I started to position the jaw on the skull, I felt like it just wasn't sitting quite right. Some of the bones were failing each other, so I decided to grind them back a little bit with my Dremel. This might not be entirely necessary for you, and this isn't a scientifically accurate model by any means for me, so I'm not too fussed. Mainly, I just want something that looks good to put on the shelf. Taking the Dremel, I ground the bones down, just so they had that little bit more clearance to sit nice and snug. With that fitting nicely now, it's time to glue the jaw assembly onto the skull. And while that dries, I'm just going to touch up these little extra nose bones as well with the Dremel, making sure they're going to fit nicely, and then we can glue them on. Lastly, let's take those gill bones and fit them onto the joints on the skull and marry them up with the lower jaw.
I had a few bones left over here, but I didn't feel I could really add anything to the skull mount and retain the symmetry and look that I had without it feeling even more incomplete. I opted to just leave it there. To finish, I cut off a nice section of a hardwood fire log I had lying around and I gave it a little polish with some beeswax. Drilling a hole in the center, I used some stainless steel rod I had lying around and screwed that into the timber. I drilled a little hole in the bottom of the skull and then mounted it on that rod. To clean it all up, I just took a cotton bud or a q-tip, whatever you like to call them, and I dipped it into the acetone that we used earlier, and I used it to wipe the skull down, taking off any of the drips of super glue or marks from my fingers. I'm stoked with how this one turned out, and it's a little over a month old now, and we don't have any major yellowing or discoloration. It's still a little off-white. And I think that is to do with me cooking the head. There's a school of thought that when you apply more heat to the bones, it's gonna start baking in some of those oils and grease. So in future, I'm probably not gonna cook the head. I'm gonna separate it and remove it if I wanna do this kind of process. And that heating as well is also gonna to extend to actually simmering or steeping the head. I'm not even gonna be doing that. I'm gonna be using a process called maceration. Maceration, you basically just put the head with all the meat on it into a bucket of water put the lid on and let it sit. And every few days, you're gonna change that water until all of the flesh has broken down. It's a very gentle process of removing the meat and it means that you can keep all of these tiny little delicate bones and you're not applying all this extra heat which might be baking in those oils. This can be a fiddly and time consuming process but be patient and take your time with it because in the end, it's all worthwhile for a product that's gonna last a long time and really capture those memories for you. I'm really interested to hear what you guys reckon and if you try this maceration method for yourself, let me know in the comments down below. I'm really interested to hear if some people try this and see if they have any better results than I did. As well, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content coming up.